condition is really crazy condition. I mean, I shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Mateo Yakino giving up to an elbow off his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team's just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode 62. And this week, I think we have a podcast that you didn't know you needed in your life. But trust me, this is probably one of the best podcasts that we've put out. No joke. So we're talking about a guy who grew up in Cuba. We're going to hear all about that. We're then going to hear about how he learned to windsurf. Why? to escape. He windsurfed with his mate from Cuba to the US of A. We're going to hear about the crazy story. We're going to hear about finding opportunities over there in America. We're going to talk to him about the windsurfing scene in America and what he does now and how he's built his brand, Tilo International. We're going to talk to him about what he's doing for the kids over there. It is crazy. He's into yacht clubs. He's got them on the foils. Such an inspirational story. If you don't like this podcast, there is something wrong with you. Who is it? Well, it is, of course. Alex Morales. Alex, how you doing, man? Hey, how you doing, my kid? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, thank you for having the time to uh, get us on the podcast. Uh, you guys have been doing an amazing job. And um, uh, we really appreciate, I think, uh, you know, 100% of the windsurfing community that is active today. Really enjoy the podcast. Something was missing. Uh, you know, after the magazine, which was kind of the last gray scene, I think you guys are, you know, doing the better job ever, right? On the windsurfing um, community in general, because it gives you a lot of uh, interesting insight of everything, writers, manufacturer, industry. And, uh, and it's been great. It's been great because it's, it, 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 it you know, educate a lot of people and, uh, and it keep you, you know, keep things moving, you know, keep things interesting. So I appreciate you you took the time to to get us on on the board too. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I, I felt like the same way that it's something is missing, like a bigger, how you say, like where you can express a little bit more. And I was telling Profit for years that, uh, you know, we should, you should do something long form. You should do something. And he's like, why don't you do it for me? I'm like, man, I can't even speak English. And he's like, no, no, you, you do it. You do it. And here we are. Yeah, no, it <laughs> takes, uh, it takes, uh, we, we have to put our foot on the ground and get it done. It's just, it is what it is. I mean, and uh, I think uh, you have a good feeling of that right now. Like I, I feel like you coming from the same background. I know I'm, a little bit older than you, but you're coming from the same background where you feel like your generation didn't have the opportunity that the first generation or second generation of windsurfing did when windsurfing was in the booming. And you feel like, oh, I'm, re I'm ready, but nobody's doing it for me. And, and you're kind of, okay, well, I'm going to do it for me. That's it. Right. That's kind of what I am too, uh, for a very long time now, you know, yeah. I, I, Personally, I stop complaining and I just do more stuff. And, yeah. and that's it because... Yeah, and maybe was, today it's it's actually possible, you know, with the tools we have, like like you say, you know, everybody has a freaking podcast. Everybody has social media. Everybody can do YouTube, everybody. So so if you do it right, maybe it's harder to, to, to climb, you know, to climb through because there's so much stuff out there. But as you say, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the time is now to just take it in your own hand and, and do it. 100% the time is always now. Remember that. No matter what, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people in the windsurfing business, and, and, and this is my observation for a long time, when it was their time, they did their stuff. Now it's our time. We need to do our stuff. Nobody's going to do it for us. And um, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be done, right? And then we learn. Everybody's learning. You're learning. Ben is learning, we're learning, everybody's learning and time change. And we, you know, our final goal is to get more people into windsurf overall, right? So yeah. we're going to make mistakes. The next podcast, we're going to get a battle 
or whatever, right? But we just got to keep moving forward, getting yeah. people engaged. Yeah. Speaking of opportunities or limited opportunities, you grew up in, in Cuba. And as a person that grew up in a country just coming out of communism, I can, on, I can imagine maybe a little bit more, but for the general public, tell me what's, what's life like, like everyday life in, what was it like in the eighties in, in, in Cuba, you know? Uh, well, <clears throat> communism is a really bad thing, including socialism. So I know a lot of young generation, they're being pretty brainwashed. Uh, because they really haven't really lived on the reality of being in an oppressor, uh, public, uh, um, you know, system. And uh, and it's just bad. Uh, the only, you know, it's you don't have an opportunity to grow. That's very simple. You need to be part of the system. You need to be yes, sir, no, sir. And you need to be part of the system. Your opportunity for growing are pretty much zero. Uh, if you're becoming part of the system and you're going to snitch on your neighbor, which is kind of what, you know, socialists and communists is, uh, and then they give you an opportunity because now you become an asset for, for the system. And that goes into sport and goes into everything, right? And jobs, sport, doctors, goes to everything, all levels of society. So it's really, um, it's the worst system ever created. Uh, and it's a system that it controlled people at the top. So, uh 80s in cuba we uh you know was, was limited future i mean like this uh this, there is no dream just put it that way but right? you don't have any dream right so whatever you think you wanted to do you're going to be limited to what the state allows you to do and that's about it and you know and so people who don't have any dream and any desire they're conform with sense Socialists and communists, you know, work okay for them because, but the people who are more entrepreneurial, people wanted to move forward, when people want to create new future businesses, you know, infrastructure, whatever, you you feel trapped. It's you trapped in the cage and you cannot do anything. So if you have a lot of dreams and it's you know is really sad compared with the free world, you know, which which is. Well, we are right, right, right here with all the problems that they say they has. You know, you you come over here and then you you make a, a new life, and in three years you are running, and the sky is the limit. I mean, obviously every system is not perfect, but the opportunity for the individual freedom to move forward in life and and achieve goals is just it's up to you. It's not up to the system. It's it's how much you want it and how much effort and work and time you put them into. So yeah, Cuba was a really bad experience for me. When, you know, so I, when I was 21, I took uh, took off and came here. So that's, that's man, I, I wanted to do it early, but you know, I was younger and I was really trying to explore older venues to see if I could, uh, maybe I was wrong. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, wait, let's give a little chance. But, it was everything that was going to, you know, I wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah. 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 And, but somehow like, despite all that limited, limited opportunity and all that s- stuff, you somehow started when I, I was, I was actually, you know, doing some research. I'm like, how d- did he learn to windsurf specifically to escape? Like, no, you actually were windsurfing and you were even on like the Olympic team and stuff. How, yeah. how did that, come about well you know the, the, the and, you know i don't want to say a good thing because nothing is a good thing but as as the socialists and the communist system they didn't have any economy the economy is really bad obviously because they don't have a free enterprise or open enterprise economy so what they did is they're marketing their country with sport sports and us, yeah right so that was the biggest marketing stone they did so the rest of the country is hungry Nobody has an opportunity, but they say, oh, let's create X amount of athletes who can represent the country in the Olympic. And that would make a good statement for us. Like, oh, look, we're not, we're doing good. We got athletes, we got high performance, everybody got an opportunity. So with that, they creating, uh, they create, you know, a lot of academies for all the sport and then including sailing. 
So sailing was developed in Cuba, and we got, you know, we got some polished boat, you know, we got Optis and Cadetes and all that. So I grew up, a friend of mine, a friend of family hooked me up to go to this, you know, uh, sailing school, and I, I was hooked. They won. I, I'm, what? I'm going to be sitting on this little bathtub with a little square sail and uh, going to be sailing all day? Three or four hours a day, I'm in. This is beautiful. So I, I jump into the sailing work early at nine years old. <clears throat> and uh, and I took off from there and I was actually really good. I was really good sailor. And then and then windsurfing came along. As I think uh, we, we, in Cuba, they introduced the first windsurfing in 19... Well, I have a boy since 1980 because a friend of our family uh, has a board, so I got access, but I couldn't reach the sale, you know, the old original uh, uh, windsurf. But I continued sailing until I was, you know, a little bit big enough. So eventually, Cuba introduced windsurfing, I think, a year 19, about 1982, 83, into the Olympic windsurfing program because the Olympic game was going to happen in 1984, which was the first Olympic and the science. So they wanted to have a team for that. So they bought all the equipment. They bought like four or five equipment. And they got four guys who were, you know, windsurfing before. One of them was, uh, some of them were my coaches later on. But that's how it started. And then I look at it and I'm like, what? What is that? You know, windsurf, that's cool stuff. And, you know, the eight is beautiful. The sail was full of color. You got all the sailing boat with the sail wide and all that. And then. And truly, the, the windsurfing guys, we, we were at the Jack Club and we sail the beach. And they take all the girlfriends. I mean, truly, they got all the girls, all the girls. And I'm like, I wanted to do that. So eventually, you know, I keep sailing to a grow up, but I start making my own boards. So I get, you know, make my own custom board with foam or whatever. Kind of like what the Brazilians are doing, kids are their, you know, mangrove, boom, two pieces tied together with a rope. Uh, universal with two nails, you name it, little cell, whatever. And then, you know, when I finished school, I started windsurfing at home. And then eventually <clears throat> that led to a little bit better equipment until I was big enough to switch from regular sailing boat dinghies, like lasers and put 20s and stuff like that, uh, to windsurf. And then, and then that was it. That was, and the switch for me was about, uh, 1980, uh, I think my first year in Windsor was 1987, 87, 88. And I, I went to the junior uh, nationals and I won it. I, was, I sell six days a week, every single day. So I live by the water. I sell the, at the club uh, about five days a week. And one or two days at my house, I don't know, and Sunday too. So I drove up on Monday. I was ahead of the game all the time, two days. No matter who was there, I was two days ahead. So it's it was and yeah. beautiful. The best, yeah. best thing ever happened to me. Yeah. And you were you were I I don't know, I was trying to to find, but I couldn't find it. Like it's it said somewhere that you actually qualified to go to the 92 Olympics. But did you go or because it also said that you were a little bit maybe too outspoken in your uh yeah, you in got, your in your was, freedom freedom I was views. Too yeah. big mouths to uh, always believe in what I believe and never keep it I'm never holding back. And then, you know, half of my family was here since 1980, 1979 here in Miami. They flew Cuba early and then Maria Bowleaf, uh, which was a big exodus in the nineteen eighties. And then uh, I was really never able to really integrate on the system. And, you know, you can fake it for a little bit, but at some point they live with you every single day. And and going back to this niche system on the socialist and the communist system, you deal with these people every single day. So at some point you say the wrong thing, they're watching you, and then they snitch on you behind. So when the Olympic comes, you qualify, you're ready to go, your passport is not ready. You can't go because your passport is not ready. It, so I, there was always something with me, no matter how many times I win the national or junior championship class, windsurfing, sailing, you name it, my passport wasn't ready. 
And who he should have passed for? <laughs> the government. So, you know, it's that's that's what I got from Crazy, the commons yeah. and the socialists. So, uh, you know, and it's it, it, it just crunches people's future left and right, no matter what. And it's, you know, and it, that's something I would never forget. So I would never forget because, you know, that, that lead to the rest of the stuff that we're going to talk about in a little bit. But it's, it's very important that somebody, you know, tell the story the way it is because I, I feel, I don't want to get too political, but I feel like a n- new generation have not enough experience, have really not really suffered enough. They don't know the price of freedom and they becoming part of the problem by by promoting something they really don't know, right? Like socialists and communists and, and all these little things that it takes human to very low uh, <clears throat> level in society anyway. Yeah, yeah. So then you decide, okay, it's time to leave this place. And... You you try to you try to escape on 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 a raft like twice, is that true? Yeah, because look, I'm <clears throat> I'm not I'm not smart, but not that dumb either. So it's a hundred the straight line is 128 miles from from the front of my house. I, I live in the water. I got a beach in, in the, the north in the north coast. Yeah, somewhere in the north. Yeah, in the north, it's basically a straight line to Key West. But the straight line is a 128 miles. Uh, do you want to swim surf 128 miles? Uh, not sure. <laughs> Maybe these days, yeah, but back then, probably so, not. <laughs> yeah. So I always got that in the back of my mind, you know, like if this is going to be the last resort. Sure, I will win surf, but I can go on a raft, you know, basically an inflatable raft with a motor, with a 30 horsepower, and that's going to be a little bit more comfortable. But so I tried that a couple of times, but it was really hard. I was lucky I didn't get caught because if you get caught, you, you're going to jail for about <coughs> five to 10 years. So I, I jump, uh, you know, nighttime. It's just, this is a mission. This is like Rambo. This is like Mission Impossible 7. You know, you, this is real. The, you, you're getting caught and you, you're going for a long time to jail. And uh, so I tried that two times with a couple of friends and that is always little bit problem one time the motor broke and we we're like we have to go back uh and then the second time uh the motor was good but the raft got pinched on the rock when we put them on the water this is all have to be at night time okay this is at nine o'clock uh while the rest of the country is watching soap opera exactly at nine o'clock so you got to be from nine to nine ten. so you got 30 minutes to get the raft out Go through the rock, go into the water. It's 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 it's, it's a nightmare. One day we'll we'll try to do something to show people, but kind of like escape from Alcatraz, more or less. Is is that type of mission? So I did it two times. It didn't work out, and I'm like, all right. So I guess we have to win. Yeah. <laughs> was it so common? Was it of- was it common to escape on those rafts? Like you knew people, like like your I don't well, know your classmate. Oh, he didn't. You know, he, I don't know, your teammate from windsurfing or whatever. You're like, ah, this guy didn't show up to, we didn't see him for a while. Probably he escaped or whatever. Was it like a thing that people would do or? Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of, a lot of people escaped. And Raph from the, the beginning of the 90s uh, was, it was a thing to do. That's, that was the only escape. Remember the 90, 89, your Berlin Wall went down. Uh, Cuba didn't have any more free money from the Russians. Uh, Nikita Gorbachev, uh, what was that? Not Nikita, the other one. Uh, Gorbachev, um, no? Gorbachev took, you know, so he cut down the uh, all the money was going to come to Cuba. So we were struggling. I mean, the whole country was, it was always struggling, but at this time it was more struggling because the, we didn't have any resource uh, or, or much resource. Because again, the communist country, because... <laughs> If I'm running a country like Cuba, Jesus Christ, I make it. We're gonna be rock and roll. We got everything. We got beaches. We we got land. We can grow, but no, the government doesn't let you do low, grow food on the land. Doesn't let you to to do anything. Everything has to be controlled by the state, so they can stay in control. That's why the economy doesn't work. So the Russian pull out the money, and um, and that's it. And uh, the the country was struggling, so people were fleeing whatever they could, whatever they can find. So a lot of people died 
11,000 people died in the middle of the Strait of Florida in those in 10 years in the 90s. Fuck. That was that was really tough, really tough. Yeah, that's crazy. So knowing all that, you still decide, okay, we're going to windsurf. Three of you, right? Yeah, so <coughs> I have... Uh, I got a couple of friends uh, who are very good friends from the beach. They were not part of uh, what I was doing at the sailing and windsurfing academy, but they just, you know, free windsurfers. You know, there, there, there was always a way to find equipment because, you know, the hotels, they buy equipment, you know, the, to rent windsurfing, this and that. And somehow you can always find eventually something around. Uh, but I found this, this guy who, you know, will grow up. Uh, together and they like uh, actually that's a funny story so one day I see them you know sailing like 25 miles upwind and then back and I saw them doing live for three days and I'm like oh these guys are cooking something so I went to see them like uh, hey what's going on here what are you guys doing oh blah 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 and I'm like no no you're leaving so all right now we are three Actually, it was their idea. I wanted to do it with another friend, but he kind of backed up a little bit. And I saw these other two friends of mine do it, but they didn't talk. It was so, so <laughs> secret. And I'm like, oh, I know what you're doing. And then we, we got together and then, uh, and then we, you know, I joined the team with that for sure. Yeah. So the preparation, like it's a 128 miles straight line. It's a little bit upwind, right? Like, Trades like what north, uh, east, east, the northeast. The wing is coming out of the out of the east trade wing. So Cuba is in the bottom, uh, Florida is on the top. The wing is coming out of the, the side. Uh, but you know you kind of have to do some tag, and I will tell you why. But uh, it wasn't straight. You can't do a straight line because so many all the stuff too. But so basically, you have to go a little bit more into the Gulf of Mexico, like kind of if you point to Texas, if you look on the map. And then why? Because the Coast Guard will stay around 12 miles out of the coast, the, the north coast of Cuba. So if you go straight line, they're going to be waiting 12 miles all the side. They're going to catch. So the way so you go downwind first. Going, yeah. So you go downwind first. Very west yeah. first, go out about 15, 20 miles, and then you tack, and then you get in there current or golf current and then you go a little bit east and then you talk again so we did three i got a map at some point i, I did a presentation the other day at one of the jack club that i work uh and i have everything recorded so at some point i will do a documentary or something that it will explain but but it was a lot of preparation and we we work on this uh really hard and then for the preparation actually we 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 needed to meet the the, the window of opportunity uh, that was super important. So uh, important time it, in the winter you cannot do because we're too close to the U.S., right, to Miami area, and you're getting a lot of cold fronts coming on the winter time. So the cold front is big wave, obviously, a lot of wind, big sea. You don't want to be in there. And then on the summer time, there's no wind, a lot of showers, very calm water. You're not moving. And you're going to be under the rain. So you kind of have to be on the spring time, right? Before the summer, the end of the spring. That's kind of your window. So we, we pick up April. April, I, we did April 27, but we pick up the, the week of April 20 to uh, April 29. That was the perfect time to do it throughout the whole year. So the first year we prepared really well. We got all ready. And the cold front came in really late. So we couldn't really, it passed already April 25, 26, 27. And we were going to go into uh, May, which is not good because and then you get a lot of rain, no wind. And then we have to wait one more full year. That's, that was incredible. So we, we make a decision that we're going to train, we're going to relax, get more girlfriends, having a good time for one more year, and then uh, prepare again and get ready for the next year, the same exactly window. And we did it and it was, was you know, good. But uh, one thing for sure, we did not jump on the board and just go, none of that. We were prepared. I was, well, I was went surfing for my life anyway. I broke, you know, you know how many fins I broke, universals. So we all have double of 
everything. I got aluminum mass instead of uh, carbon fiber or glass. We have um, double universal, double fans. Um, I made my own sails, windsurfing sail. I made my own. I got a, uh, remember the old uh, Lesnar sail, the Division Two, the one that went to the, the third Olympic, the second Olympic, 1992. I took one of those. I cut the, the bass, uh, you know, the lower part of the sail right on top of the boom. And then I got a, a Mistral wave sail, and I saw that from the boom to the top. So now I have an open leach sail with a lot of low end on the bottom, just in case we get into a big storm. I didn't have to have a super tight leach sail on the top. Like, you know, that Lechner sail was, I think it was a 7.5, 7.4, something like that. But it was very powerful, very deep and all that, but it didn't release. So, so... We, we did that. I got Frank who got sewing machine who repair ourselves and we make. So it was a lot of preparation, really. And uh, it was, you know, we, we weren't lucky. We, you know, obviously we were lucky at some point. We were lucky, but, but the preparation really pays off. Pays off because we knew what we were going to do and, and what it was going to take. Yeah. You guys had any like navigation gear or any anything we did we did we have some compass we have some regular compass the one from diving that you put on your wrist and we have uh we got flare uh lights and we got whistles you know uh basic stuff you know talking about 1994 there was no gps technology phones none of that but we yeah. got some basic survival stuff yeah. and uh, <clears throat> so we prepare as best we could and yeah. we we train we train about five hours a day six days a week it was just insane i mean and then we were like skinny like this got tons of energy we we're john uh we, we could sell for forever forever and you know yeah and, and very yeah. efficient yeah and obviously 94 very limited forecasting right how do you know, like, okay, you see the trade winds, you know, on the shore of Cuba, you see out, whatever, out to sea, but, years. This is, but, uh, but years you, don't, you, you don't know, right? Like if maybe in the middle it's well, going to shut off or. Well, coming from, uh, I coming from a village of fishermen, obviously most of the, you know, water from uh, places are, you, you get, you know, where you get boats and all that, you got fishermen. And this is a lot of knowledge from before, right? Like, so. That's what we pick this time during the year because historically, that's what has happened during this time. And the window was, you know, I told you it's like 20 to 29. We're talking about 10 days window period where everything is perfect. You get a nice breeze, 12 to 15 miles an hour wind, no rain, no cold front, steady wind, and the wave is going to be your regular wind wave, 12, 15. So it's going to be super easy. And this is, you know, for whatever, hundreds of years, right? It kind of happened the same. So this is all information knowledge from the old fishermen. And, and these people have a lot of experience because back in the 50s, this is very old people, but before the 50s, before Cuba was common, is these people were going to Mexico for a fishing trip and come back. So they knew every everything really well. They're going, you know, remember how the wind, how the sport of sailing really started is sailing was the original merchant ship boat, right? So all these old guys that they live in my town, I, I go and sit down with them every night, right? At their house, and they, they were like, I was 15, 16, they were 85, right? And uh, they taught me all the story, and, and they so much knowledge because before the, you know, the, uh, before the, the merchant ship, you know, power boat, they're going around the island of Cuba on a sailboat to bring merchandise from one part of the island to the other one. And no forecast. This is by sailing. And these people became the best sailor uh, ever. And then eventually they, you know, and, and it happened in every country. British, right? They conquered the world by sailing boat, right? So they knew the time. So we kind of went back to to basic and like, okay, so this is the window of opportunity because, you know, for the last 300 years, been like this so it's not going to be a cold front on the 27th you know yeah. <coughs> kind yeah that's crazy that's crazy what do you what do you remember from the trip i mean you 
You say a lot. I remember lot. everything. The only thing, the only mistake I make is, you know, it's summer, right? And it's the warm, it's, it's hot and everything. So I forgot to bring a wetsuit. <laughs> so I was doing gray. I got a long sleeve, short. You know, obviously, you launch, you launch at night, right? You launch at night. Oh, we launch, through the no, night. We launch, no, we launch in the morning, then uh, oh. 11 o'clock in the morning, because uh, the Coast Guard, uh, those days, and I'm sure now still do it. What they do is the Coast Guard leave at 6 p.m. from the port and then go in outside Cuba uh, line between Cuba and the U.S. around 12 miles. And then they, they stop the motor and this, they stay there 12 miles off, off the coast. Next day, about 5 o'clock in the morning, they, they turn off the motor and then they start going from 12 miles, start going back into the coast. And whatever they found in there, that's the people yeah, like that got caught. Right? Canvassing, so kind of, right? Like, uh, yeah. So if you don't make it, you know, which is, it's all numbers, really. If you're on a raft and you raft going at three miles an hour speed, uh, how long would it take you to get to 12 uh, miles, right? So, and if you don't do it on time, you're going to get cut. Very simple, right? So we knew this because we watched them forever, right? Like we knew everything. And there is always a, a, a friend of yours that his dad works on there and they kind of slip the information and we pay a lot of attention. And by the time they're coming back into shore and they go inside the port, the Coast Guard, it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. By that time, they finish whoever they, you know, in the 90s, they pick it up, whoever wants to leave illegal and come back. By the time they're coming in, guess what we were doing? We're going now. But remember this, we did this for two years straight. So they see us every single day do exactly the same thing. They're coming in, we say, oh, those are the windsurfers. They do the same thing every day. And to one day, we didn't do the same thing every day. We just took off. And by the time it was next day, we we're on the Key West. That's it. Just like that. So I we really, <coughs> like yeah, to... it was, this is a whole, it was, it was really well prepared. There was no, no chance for anything other than, you know, maybe, I don't know, you break a something, a sale, but, you know, in general, we were as prepared as we could possibly. Yeah. How long did it take, finally? 18 hours. 18 hours. Yeah. <coughs> and you remember, fast. like, you were you, like, so full of adrenaline and whatever? Or or, or at, at one point, I mean, you got to be fucking tired, right? I mean... I didn't eat for a long time. Uh, yeah, I was tired, but we were so pumped. Um... The other day, just the other day, uh, you know, I finally, uh, uh, we, we got picked up about 20 miles from Key West. I think in general, we sell about 150, about 150 miles, we think, you know, with, with all the tax that we did and the aviation and all that, we definitely added at least 30 or 40 more miles to, to the straight line, which is 128. And then <clears throat> we were like uh, uh, about 130 in the morning. We were already sailed maybe 140, 150 miles. We got this boat coming in <clears throat> that it goes to Key West. We're about 20 miles. And we basically dropped the sail at nighttime because we want to get, you know, a little rest. It just didn't make sense. So we can rest three, four hours, five hours. And uh, so, so it's calm and enough. So it's like, so it's calm enough that you can just drop the sail and kind yeah, of relax. Yeah, we It's so calm. You know, it's a little bit of weight, but, and then we put the three boards together and make it like, you know, kind of like a, Big platform Craft, with yeah. all the sail, we tied it up. And then, you know, we just lay on top of that and relax a little bit because we already sailed for a long time and we were good. But why you wanted to do that when you can do in the morning, you can rest, you know, four or five hours more, drink some water, relax, the sun come out, boom, and do the next 20 hour miles, which is going to be two more hours. And that's it. So, but doing that, we got a big boat coming in. We saw a big boat coming in. We're like, whoa. This is going to break us. Uh, it's going to pass through us. And, um, and, and at that point, <coughs> we got the decision. We put the flare light because it was kind of dangerous. It's not like it's going to, you know, go in 10 feet behind us. In the middle of the ocean, it's coming straight to us. And we put the flare, boom. And then the boat keeps going. We only got one flare. That was fine. And, uh, and like, whoa, what happened? If the captain's sleeping and it's autopilot. And he didn't see the flare. We blow it. And the boat, they're like, ooh. 
And we're like, yeah. And then, you know, we got a flashlight and a whistle and the whole thing. Now the boat started putting out some headlights looking for us. And we were like, you know, I came in. Um, uh, and, and it was Kevin, uh, Captain Kevin. So who I met in January again today after 27 years. We've been in contact, but he's, he lived in another town in Florida. And uh, he came and uh, it was so good to see him again. And uh, so this is the guy who actually picked us up. Uh, it's, it was a big boat. And um, and then he took us to Key West. Um, you know, it took like, I think, an hour, 45 minutes to get to Key West. So we were very close. And, and you knew like, you knew like once you saw that boat, you knew you were safe or is was there a chance that these guys are going to be like, these guys are going to be like, ah, you guys fuck off or whatever you know like oh they pull out they said the whole the movie's getting better so once we stop you know they stop they came in they look three guys on the water with the windsurfing gear going like this in the middle of the ocean they got scared so they turn around the boat pull out two truck guns on the back of the boat pirates right pirates on windsurfers <laughs> you never know <clears throat> you never know right so it could be pirates so they got freaked out they got a big boat it was a 52 um, uh, Hatteras, I think. It's a big boat, a lot of money. So it was a boat from the brother of the governor of Florida. Very wealthy people. Uh, they came from Mexico in a fishing tournament, and they're like, whoa, what is this? This is weird. So they got close and eventually, uh, you know, pulled out the truck gun, and they like, hey, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Like, obviously, my friend went to school to, you know, learn English for two years. They forgot everything. I didn't know anything. I didn't speak English. And we only, hey, Q, uh, Windsor, that's it. And, uh, but they were kind enough to say, okay, <clears throat> one by one, come into the boat. And, um, and then we jump in the boat one by one. We swim in, leave the board in the back. One of the, the guys stay at the back. I think I was the first one to swim into the boat. So, something like that. And then, you know, we kind of strip a little bit. They were with the truck gun, make sure we don't have any knife, no guns, this and that. They don't know, right? They sleep in the middle of the line and you see three guys, it's big. What is this, right? So, and then it was super cool after that. We pulled all the equipment. They figured it out. We came from Cuba. We escaped on Windsor. Nobody ever heard about that. Um, that there was a couple of the guys before us, but anyway. Um, and uh, and they took us to Key West. They called the Coast Guard, and the U.S. Coast Guard say, "Well, bring it over to the Key West station. We take it from there." And um, and then that's it. And then we went to the Coast Guard. Uh, you know, they they drop us in the at the uh, at the dock, and um, and then the Coast Guard came in, put our took our equipment. We did a couple interview with the Coast Guard, make sure we were, you know part of the government, whatever. And uh, and then since, you know, Cuba, because we've been here for a long time, a lot of generation of Cuba, part of the family, they went and picked me up the same day. Next day, I'm already in Miami. It's like, it's good, beautiful. So, yeah. yeah, that was something. Yeah, so at that time, it was normal. Yeah, they had so much people coming over that it was not, it was not an issue to legalize your, your stay, get some some permit. Oh, or at that time, <coughs> the Cubans have a, a law because of the uh, of uh, what happened in the um, in the in the missile crisis in Cuba in '67, yeah. I think. So we had there was a law of adjustment of status. So if people are claiming political asylum, they were escaping from Cuba, persecuted, whatever. <clears throat> you 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 attach yourself to that law. Uh, and in our case, it was very clear that's exactly what it was, especially in my case, it was, you know, the government never really did anything. It always, you know, pushed me down and everything. So, um, so yeah, that was kind of easy. Today, it seems a little bit different, but, uh, but those days, that, that was very straight cut, you know. Straight yeah. cut, you leave and, and you can prove, you know, uh, proof of, uh, prosecution or retaliation, they, you know, you could <clears throat> stay over with visa of, uh, I mean, with the 
um, political asylum, basically. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you still got the gear from the from the trip? I had the gear for a long time, but it's just too much. You know, they they went from one house to another house, another house, and at some point we we lost it. Um, but uh, shit. yeah, it is. Should I auction it off or something? You know, I think it will. Be yeah, I cool. think that we're gonna find it. I because my stuff, I live at the museum in Key West, and I think some of the stuff is still there. I haven't be, been there in a long time now, but I might go and check. I, I know the picture. My pictures are in uh, Key West Museum. Our picture of the three when we up there are in the museum, uh, Key West Museum of I don't know what the name is, but it's historical museum. Yeah, that's pretty sick. Very, very, very well deserved, I would say. Well, yeah. truly, you know, the story becoming obviously with the with the years passed by, the 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 the, the story is obviously you can feel that I can feel very passionate about it. But it's you know we we didn't do any of this to have a story or to be cool. We this is life and death reality of surviving mode, right? Now it's cool because. Uh, and not too many people do that uh, today. Uh, some people have been doing some hard stuff today, as we speak. But but now it's a cool story because I can tell. Uh, but before that, I mean, we never talk about the story. We talk about that this is what we got to do to survive, right? And get yeah. ourselves into a new, you know, opportunities in life, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So and yeah, come- it was, and that goes back into. I always put my hand on the pillow and I'm like, what did I'm doing? How did I get here? How did I survive? How did I change everything? Windsurfing. So what did I going to do with my life? Windsurfing. That's it. It's pay back 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you accomplished that goal. You're you're free, right? You feel you're free. Yeah. But well then, I mean, nobody really, of course, for, for, for all these years of planning, for all this, for sure you didn't think what I'm going to do when I get there, right? Because you were so focused on... on. No idea. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. I will figure it out the next day when I get there, right? First step is surviving, escaping, getting a place where your infrastructure is possible and your dreams can be possible and then... Focus again, look at the dream, and step two, uh, let's make it happen. But now you're in a place where you actually can do it. And that's really the whole the whole thing behind it. It's, it's, that's the mental game, right? If, if, if things not going your way or, or the things, you have to move up. You got to move up and, and go to where things will be. Possible, not not easy, not free, not none of that, but possible. There is a possibility, yes, which is kind of what we were talking about early on, on you guys doing the podcast and, and what you guys are doing is it's a possibility. Yeah, we're, we're, might not be Joe Rogan. You might not be Joe Rogan, but you might be the next Joe Rogan, right? That's what it takes. It does the possibility. If the possibilities are there, everything. It's up to the individual, right? So yeah. it, I have no plan, really. I have yeah. no plan when I show up. I just want to show up. And then like, I'm going to look around and see what the next day will be. And uh, yeah, it took some time. But... Yeah. Did you did you seek out the windsurfing scene straight away? Like, I mean, 90s, yeah. obviously. <laughs> 94, it's like right at, you know, right at probably some sort of the end of the peak, right? So so there must have been some sort of a scene. I think it was it was it was uh it was Ryan the money. So our next step was gonna go to to go to Maui, right? Once we're in Miami, we settled going to my to Maui, but you know, we also Miami is a very cultivating city too, because it's not like a little village, you know, Miami itself is an is an animal. Mm-hmm. And we got beautiful beaches. We got a place called Virginia Key, which is very close to Kanaha. When it's when it's windy, is it's a beauty, right? So every year we plan to go to Maui, and then since you know you get complicated with this, we have to make a living too, right? We we show up. We have some of us got family, but 
we're young, we need to work, we need to make a living, we're not gonna rely on anybody on anything. Um, oh, one, uh, um, one second. Yeah. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so it's, you know, the next plan to go to Maui and do the whole rock star, what you're doing right now, which is kind of what we wanted to do. I wanted to do what you're doing right now, right? Going to my we do the PWR tour. That's that's the whole thing, but it didn't materialize for me because I have it's uh it's, it's you know you're growing also and, and at some point you got to put your foot on the ground for me and be responsible and try to achieve a life. I got family now. I got family like my family, but. It was always something, and uh, sleep out. The whole month we seen sleep out, so I couldn't go to the next stage. But I, but I was content. I was happy because I'm, um, you know, at least I was in a place where, where I have an opportunity to do stuff in the future, and so I don't have to, you know, chase the athlete dream of or the professional dream. Also, there is all the stuff that he also made me happy, basically, right? Which is kind of what I'm doing now. And and that is equally or, or more uh, satisfying, I would say, than, than just the, just being an athlete and winning, winning event. I guess I, I never win any world title. I don't know how it feels, but uh, doing what, what we're doing now with, with in general for windsurfing in, in the U.S. and Miami, is really gratifying. It's uh, so I was I accept my defeat that not going to Maui and be uh, you know a professional windsurfer, uh, but I it's I'm happily uh, equally happy doing what I'm doing now. So I I don't feel like I'm missing uh, I miss the opportunity of my life either. You know so yeah, you got to keep a balance, right? Yeah. Having won a PWA contest, I think I, I, I doubt it feels uh, the same way. Like, like arriving to Florida after freaking eighteen hours of <laughs> of, uh, well, but, uh, of sailing. It's different, <laughs> but it's yeah. a big achievement. I mean, everything, anything that we conquer, that you conquer, or I conquer, whatever we do as as a person, that it takes. Like, imagine you eventually you're gonna win your world title. And it's going to happen, you know, this is right on the wall. It's just, you just got to keep showing up and it's going to happen, right? Um, <clears throat> because you put the time and the dedication. So that's going to feel a milestone. And and who deserve that? You do, because of your focus and, and everything that you do and your dedication. So um, it's, it's going to feel amazing. My story, it feels amazing for me because... It ratified that my effort and my focus pay off, right? So it's, it's not like, wow, I waste all my life and I didn't do anything. Well, I try. I keep trying and I, you know, I push it and that one worked out pretty good. So that gets you more confident for the next state, right? And and the next project and, and the next. So we'll take a lot of those little questions that we have in our head all the time, like, ah, I'm not sure about this. So the they're not sure about this. That's that will become out of your brain forever, and everything is going to be possible. Obviously, it will take a little bit longer here and there, and but but there there will be no more doubts on your head. That's that's yeah. that's what I think. Uh, all this little thing did for me. The doubt level is just gone. I'm, I'm, you know, and it's up to me if I'm lazy, I don't make it happen. If I work hard. It happened just because it's it's up to me. It's not up to anyone. Right? Yeah, totally, totally. Um, for us in Europe, the U.S. scene is always kind of a, a not a question mark. But for me, I, I don't really like. I was born in '91, you know, so yeah. the only thing I can see is like, yeah, windsurfing was big, kind of on the West Coast in the '90s, and right now it's doesn't seem all that big and, and whatever. Describe to me like the, how to understand, obviously you're, you're in Miami, um, for, for what, 20 years now, pretty much. Um, sorry, 30 years. We have 20, 20, <laughs> yeah, 30, 30 years. years. Yeah. 
Um, so describe to me, like, how does the, the scene work and how you see seen it, you know, probably drop and develop and drop again and develop again through, throughout the years, the U S windsurfing scene, what do we have to understand about it as Europeans? We more. Well, we, we got that, that was the, the whole, that's my whole life. That's the story of my life. Right. So I show up and I'm like, okay, where's the party? Like, as you always say, hey, well, how was the rock star guys on the night, right? And you're like, why? You know, what is the party where everybody went, right? And I'm like, I'm doing the same. Okay, let's do it. And, and oh, there's nobody. So I'm along with this party. So it's simple, right? Windsurfing. <coughs> Windsurfing was big when it was big because... Very simple. You have a board that you can sail on five miles an hour wind all the way to 25 miles an hour wind, right? And a little lake, whatever. You got a one long board with a dagger board. Everybody goes Saturday and Sunday to the beach. Everything is good, beautiful. No matter what the wind condition, you go out with the family, you have a good time. That's it. Simple. That's how windsurfing got big. They took it to Maui, short board, you know, asymmetric tail down the line, bro. Hey, what's up, bro? Destroy the sport. No matter how cool they are, and I love all of them, in general, everybody's guilty. Everybody. Because you can't do that. You got to stay on the path. You can do that a little bit here and there. Now, I know it's not easy because you want to sell the image of hardcore and the way that motivate this and that. But how, how are you going to get a kid from the middle of Ohio or whatever, Arkansas or New York? Hey, look, this is how we're surfing it. Uh, down the line, uh, Hokipa with a 3.7 and 75 liter board. Can you get that done in your lifetime? No, it's not happening. So we 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 selling is a great image, but it's not achievable, right? And that's the story of the windsurfing in the U.S. And uh, Europe is a little bit easier because you know because Europe's more united and you can do a PWA tour. And the marketing is more together. People feel more related. The biggest opportunity we have after that was uh, Formula. That's when I jumped in. When I saw the Formula board, I was like, what? Can I win, sir, from 10 miles an hour win with 11 minutes sail on a Formula board? This is genius. Whoever designed this board and this equipment is genius. And then I jumped in on, on windsurfing back again, excited with the Formula because I saw the wind range go low. We don't have to be a mile with the windsurf. Now we can windsurf pretty much anywhere in the U.S. So basically, the biggest problem I see in the U.S. was was a big boom, and then we specialized the board too much. Kind of what you were talking about yesterday on your on your beach uh, podcast and, and the YouTube is everything is too specialized, and the entry level for the general public. Is is not it's not cool. So who wants to jump in in the sport that you're gonna be the the bottom feeder uh, for a long time and you're not gonna look cool? So that's the problem. So we have to resolve the problem. And I got the solution. I already did it. I got a proving concept. So what I did in Miami, we we start running Youth Windsurfing Academy inside the Jack Clubs. So the key is the keys because. The old guys, uh, is old guys will go from windsurf. They were from windsurfing to kai, from kai to powderboard, from powderboard now to wingy to kai again, and from kai to wingy. Right? It's exactly the same people. It's nothing new. So there is no new people in there. So it's exactly the same people who've been doing everything and been switching to the next thing. Now, yeah. where did you? Entry level, where it is you, you're the bottom of your period. How are you going to get a lot of new people into the sport? The five, 10 years from now, we have a very healthy new community. So that was a big question. And, you know, and, and the old guys who were running the windsurfing businesses before, yeah. truly they got really old and they made the money. And they like, you know what? I'm going to live in Maui, enjoy my life. And that's about it. So they weren't going to do what I'm doing. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So 
it took me a long time to do this that I'm doing right now in order to bring windsurfing back into the big numbers, which is going to take some time. I'm, you know, I'm only one man uh, and I got a lot working with me, but what we do so now... So, is, yeah, so what do you do now? Because I hear you go to pretty much every single little yacht club in Miami, encourage the kids to take it up. Yeah. And what what are you pitching? You're pitching foiling, you're pitching... Foiling was... All right, so <clears throat> we got, uh, and it's a funny thing, I call it the plantation, right? So the plantation, we call it the plantation, me and a couple of my friends who've been developed this. The plantation is the old style windsurfing board from the big techno with the dagger board, the, the corner board and all that, which is, they've been pushing this forever, but you got to put yourself in a situation where the kids mine it. If you see this guy with all sail, with all these flowers on top of the board, I'm sorry, but I have to say it, with this, all this flower and this old dorky sail to go at three miles an hour speed. And then next to the end is going a guy with a kite on a foil with a lot of coal, about 25 miles an hour speed. You're not going to get no any chance. Speed yeah. In. Yeah, okay? yeah, you have no so chance. When foil came along, uh, I went to, uh, uh, I was working already a little bit on, one of the jack club, but they were he they were hesitating a little bit about bringing foil in, and I got a meeting with them, and I got a couple of the 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 director of the jack club who are really big visionaries. Uh, these people have a, <clears throat> a good good vision, and they trust me. I say, look, I make let's make a, a windsurfing program foil for kids. It will take a long time because you cannot start from scratch the foil. They will need to learn the whole, you know. Uh, basic of windsurfing, and at some point, I think in about a year, they're all going to be put. And they trust me and say, okay, here is the jack club, do whatever you want. So I brought all the gear, I brought all the foil, sails, boy, you name it, I brought everything. And they, and I say, look, let me prove the concept. You don't have to invest anything, just, just give me the jack club, the infrastructure, and we run everything if it's successful, and then we, we take it from here. And uh, so what I did, I bring a lot of kids and and I show the kid how that I was foiling. And, and while they were windsurfing, I show them the foil and the windsurfing together. Right. OK, guys. So and then we develop the whole um, the whole uh, methodology of how to get them faster into windsurfing and then, you know, basic windsurfing entry level. And then intermediate, where they're already using the foot straps and the harness, they get in there playing a little bit. And after that, they, they go into a foil. I give them different foil, first, like a 55, so they tick off a little bit. But they get the feeling, but, and then the board never going sideways when they crash. You always, you know, once the, the front wing bridge, the board sits flat again, and they get, you know, the kids get scared, but poof, they feel very secure. And then they got to work hard because, you know, it's very little range on the on the mass. So they cannot go really high, but they start getting the feeling. They can start feeling the board coming out of the water. And obviously they're going 15, 16. You know, once the board out of the water, you're going 15, 16, right? Somewhere in there. And, and they love it. And they hook. That's it. That's the biggest hook. So once they get to that, and then, you know, we'll, we'll give a little bit longer mass, you know, and then little by little. So, our so, 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 so two questions. How much till this stage? How long? How long till that stage? Oh, this is, uh, that's what I was going to say. So we perfected this at the point right now that I got two kids that show up in September, nine and 10 years old. And from September, starting from learn how to windsurf with a 1.5 meter sail with nothing, a little, you know, club sail try to go up wing and down wing, get out of the dock by themselves, come back to the dock club. And December 15, they were already foiling with a 4.5 meter set. Full speed. Three months. So now this kid show up five days a week in our program. We're running a five days a week program. It's, it's a full long after school program. So every day they go in the water three hours and it's three hours and three hours and three hours. And go and go rain, no matter what, windy, light wind, strong wind, we, soft wind, it doesn't matter. We're going, going, and going, and going, and going. Three months, ready to pull, nine and 10 years old. Now the kids are killing it. 
They are sailing on a 7 and the other one is sailing on a 5 five, nine and 10 years old. So, so much technique they got to develop because they don't have the body weight, but, you know, five days a week, uh, three hours a day is a lot. It's a lot. So, yeah. it is possible. There you go, right there. I so, mean, if I, now, if, I, if I think that I grew up in freaking Poland where you can sail... Back in back then, you could sail maybe four or five months a year, you know, because wetsuits yeah. weren't so good and whatever. And I hear like these guys are doing, you know, three hours a day, five f- freaking Look, five days a week. You know, that's right now. I think we're sailing about two hundred and fifty days a year in Miami now in our product. Uh, just to give you an example, the the one of uh, the that I designed for the clubs called the convertible. I count the amount of hours on each of this board for the last two years. How many hours you think the board got on the water? 1,200 hours of use. That is insane, right? Imagine yeah. a board that's been used in 1,200 hours. That's yeah. insane. So the kids rotating the board. So it's just basically I'm having a factory of windsurf. And I'm tough. I'm tough because you can feel it and I'm, I'm very focused on what I wanted to achieve. The kids... Love. If you look at the videos that we have from our kids, they just, it's a smile from the beginning. I mean, they chop early and they leave late from the club every single day. They don't want to go home. They want to windsurf. When it's windy, I put in some of the stuff that I do when it's, when, they, when it's really windy, over 18 or 20, because they are still small, I put them on the fin. So we go on a slalom, of course, racing, because our competitive board, which is designed mostly for the club, it's a 91, it's like a big slalom. It's like your board, 91 wide, a little bit wide on the tail, but still behaving as a slalom. So we're putting it, whatever, an RSX pin, 60 centimeters, a 55, big pin. So for them, it's more like a formula, right? And they go out on the 18, 20 miles an hour wind with a, whatever, with a three or four meter sail, flying top of the wave, it's just full on rockable. And they love it. And then when it gets windy, as much as they love the foil, they all want to go on the fan when it gets windy because it's just, it's a different, right? Feel. Different they, they sensation, yeah. Jumpy or whatever. So yeah. the, the formula right now is working extremely well and we are open. We two have been on five jack clubs right now in Miami, but uh, one of the jack clubs uh, didn't do the last semester. They will restart again with us because, you know, jack clubs are politically complicated because they're all private yard club, got board members, this and that. And, and, and I do a really good, <clears throat> I'm a good, 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 you know, uh, human relation guy, I would say. So I, I get in touch with the yard club, with the infrastructure, with, with the members. And, and, and that was the missing link really for windsurfing. So now we, we have now four official clubs running product at the same time in the Miami area, one on the Florida Keys, but close by, you know, so when we are at full capacity, I think by when we start again in September, because now we finished the season, we're going to do summer camps in some of the club, but when we start in September, most likely we're going to have 120 kids in all the programs. We're surfing on 120 kids. And out of that, we probably will have, right now we got 15 kids on foil, full on ready to race from age, uh, nine to 17. And, and, and if we continue like this, I mean, I will predict by in two, three years, we might have 250 kids on the starting line on Windsor. Now that will, that will answer your question. Why this never happened in the U S well, I guess need somebody like me so hungry. And so not taking a no for an answer. Uh, Somebody could have done it before, but you know I do understand that they weren't, you know, they weren't as obsessed as we are probably. Right? Yeah. We, we need to make this happen. Yes, or no. Alexa, come over here. I want to show you my daughter. She's six. She already went so. So now I got even more. Hello, say hello, hello, everybody. Hey, Alexa, how you doing? How how do you win, sir? Downwind. Downwind. Okay, show, show much. How, how do you win, sir? How do you put your arms? Come, come over here. Show no pressure. It's only going to be like 10,000 people watching. No worries. No, okay, get close to the camera. You're not, you're not in the camera. Show. There you go. 
<laughs> but she's super fired up. Every night I have to show them the videos that we do for all the kids at the club. We do every day we do a video, right? And we post it, send it to the parents. And, and that keeps the parents super engaged on see what the kids doing during the day. And she love it. Every night before she goes to sleep, she needs to watch the videos, right? It's kind of like us when we're watching the old videos, right? And and that's the question, the answer. The answer is simple. The opportunities for windsurfing getting to the next level again is right in front of us. But somebody has to do it. We're, nothing's going to fall from the sky. World sailing is not going to do anything. This is, you know, in my opinion, our biggest enemy is world sailing because there's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of rules and regulation, but none of that rule and regulation help us to do anything. It's just constantly limited. And, and that's one of the biggest battles I got on the jack club, because every time you go into a jack club, the first thing they ask you is, oh, okay, so this is an Olympia sport. So then we're going to use, uh, what board we're going to use? Uh, what is the new youth Olympic board? Uh, IQ, whatever that is that Starboard came out with. I'm like, no, none of that. Is that Optis an Olympia sport, bathtub? No, it's not. But it's the most popular sailing dinghy in the world, right? They got their own infrastructure. So it, windsurfing is not one board, guys. Windsurfing is as big as sailing. We got entry level, intermediate, and advanced. We got freestyle, wave, speed, course racing, slalom, uh, you name it, foil, foil, freestyle, blah, blah, blah. So Ourself alone is is huge. So you cannot pretend you're going to get a five years old, six year old kid, and the first day you're going to buy him an IQ foil because he wants the kid to go to Olympic in 2052 or something. Yeah, you know you got to do one step at a time. When 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 the kid gets to 17 years old, and then we can have that conversation about if he wants to go to Olympic, yeah, and then the country will have to buy the equipment and he have to support it. But for now, we our biggest my biggest concern is getting the kids from Alexa's age, which is she's already Windsor, from six to 17 on the jack club level. Now, as I building all the big infrastructure, the next step will be whatever the kids want to do. They want to be a professional Windsor. They already got all the basics to do it because they've been sailing full on professional pretty much. My kids are professional sailing 250 days a year. You are a professional, right? That's more than no me, yeah. What. <laughs> no, no matter what, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but so that was kind of one of the problems that I have at the beginning of the Jack Club because the Jack Club, obviously, they wanted to invest on something that already have an infrastructure in place so they can sell the power. Oh, okay, well, this is, and that's a, that was a big wall because we don't have that yet. So I'm like, oh my God, I have to build that too? So I kind of have to build the whole infrastructure. <laughs> So I can sell the idea of the package idea to the club that actually the kids will be able. So not only that I have to build that, now I got to build a full a tour, tour basically. Yeah. for the jack clubs, which is easy because I already got six events on the tour in, in Florida. Every jack club now runs a race. And now every kid from the other jack club goes to that club. And now we have the full infrastructure running and less than we did this in less than three years. But uh, I mean, it, it it, it, it you can feel it. It took a lot of energy to to go to every stage, and uh, it was easier yeah. for for us because we I started the company to go in production with with TU International, and then I was able to. Yeah, I'm 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 coaching uh, besides the TU International. I'm coaching five days a week on the Jack Club because I have to be there. Because if I'm not there, the other coach is doing an amazing job. But I needed to to see what the, the, the kids are struggling, for example, the, the school board. Is the school board good enough? It's too big for the small kid or it's too small for the big kids. Uh, what sales side works better? Uh, developing on the rugged line of the board is, you know, the school board is is the rugged too short. And then when the kids put the sail with light wing at the front, if the nose goes down, it goes under the water, we might have to make it a little bit longer. You know, so the nose is a little bit up with medium wind. So all these things I'm working on every single day and the next production board, I made some changes to the next board and, and on and on and on. It goes with the sales and it goes with everything. And, and now we're achieving a level where basically I'm designing all the equipment for the Jack Club and right life, 
right? Yeah, like, no, for sure. It, it's look, it's got to be good business. Nobody's gonna blame you uh, if because like there there needs to be some sort of reward. You bust your balls for for quite a few years to you know to do that stuff. So and probably and and, and if you tell me, okay, you got five yacht clubs around Miami doing this, and if I think how big the US is and how many places there is with wind, with consistent wind, you know, um, around the country and whatever, oh, I mean, this could be, this, no, this, this is going to be a we. I mean, if everything goes according to plan, we're going to boom at a level never heard before. Right. Because there is 1500 yard clubs in the US with sailing product, 1500. If we are in 700 of this yard club with, 30 or 40 kids on program, you, you know, the country is too big. So you can't travel to there and, 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 you know, and put the same energy. So you, you have to, if, you know, if you have your home disorganized, nobody will believe it pretty much. Right. So I need to make sure that I live in Miami and Miami will be the epicentric epicentral of, of this Jew windsurfing product. And, and it's already happening. Right. So it's a proven concept. I've been working hard. Now we're going to expand from this up, you know, a little bit north of Florida, a little bit west. So little by little, the rest of the yard club will come because now they're going to see the infrastructure, five club, next year will be seven club, and the following year will be 15 clubs. And the rest is domino effect, right? Now you have 130 kids, 150 kids on a regatta when surfing, but, you know, between the, 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 the regular windsurfing fleet and the foil, Yacht Club will want to integrate that into the program because it's, it's new. It's the only it's the only program with foil for any kids under, you know, 15 years old, basically. I mean, the sailing, the sailing uh, sport in general right now, they don't have one boat with foil for you. They don't have it. There is only two yeah. companies making something. Uh, it's called Nikita. It's a boat from the... Australia with some, you know, foil, but it's very expensive, $14,000 boat. So, Yacht Club to get 10 of these, $140,000. Eh. Our equipment is $4,500. $4,500. A good Opti is $5,000. So, we are $500 cheaper than the Opti, and we're going at 20 miles an hour speed. The Opti goes at three. So, we just, it just really, we just got to stay focused and, and do what we're doing right now, but it's, I see the light like like this light in my face, a lot of light. It's um, so that's 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 the that's the only way I can see this going because the parents and the kids becoming part of our community. So we're growing our community by doing this, and the parents love the infrastructure of leaving the the kids at the yacht club, right? So they they drop the kid. Some of my kids they come in on a bike. From the yeah, school. it's like it's like they drop them to basketball or to football Same or whatever, thing. right? And then they pick it up three hours later. The kids come in with a smile. He works so hard. He's in the water. He love it. Go back and watching your show. The kids at nighttime, and so now we got new generation of of kids engaging, right? And now, <clears throat> and this is a funny. I was thinking about this the other day. Somebody asked me this yesterday. I think, and. Uh, and, and actually, a customer of mine came yesterday. He wants to do some custom board, and he's like, "Oh, I'm a little bit depressed because it's a lot of wingers out there, right? And then every time something new is coming, you're taking a market share from us. A lot of people go, and I'm like, "Well, that's a good. It's it's it's, it's going to happen. But look at what I'm doing with my kid. This is a good one. You're going to love this. So I got. I also produce wing because I have to produce the wing because it's 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 is selling people want the win. So I'm going to make the win, no matter what. I'm bored for you, name it. I got it. But, uh, so I say to my kid, when we finish the season, we finish the whole club racing, give a medal, I give money to my kid, you name it. <clears throat> they win $100. Whoever won the last, you know, series of four races. These kids are 12 years old. Get a $100 check from T International School. So, and, and I say, okay, guys, next week, is, you know, the next couple of weeks going to be more, we, we can do whatever we want, you know, so we can go winging too. And they like, oh, okay. The kids are so good. We took the wing out of the water in an hour and 50 minutes. At least three of my kids were winging 
since from scratch, never went before. Full on on the foil, up when, down when. I mean, the tax and the jive not there yet, but I went in 50 minutes. So, yeah, you know, yeah no, once you win surf, surf, if you win surf foil, winging is a, is a piece of cake for sure. Yeah, but I resolved this is the problem. This is the punchline is coming right now. So I say the other day to some of my kids, I say, yeah, Alex, because we're more relaxed. Can we go out winging? I'm like, 100%. Here's the wing, the board, and, and everything, the foil, just go. And he's like, whoa. But can you tow me out of the channel on the winging to go outside? Say, how many times did I tow you out on a windsurf board with four? Never, right? So you want a winging, you got to swim from here all the way to the other side of the channel, <laughs> and then you can winging. So it's up to you. You can choose windsurfing or winging. Which one you want? Guess what he did? Yeah, he went windsurfing. I got sure. windsurfing. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a problem solved right there for, for, for the kids. You give it to them, see if you can be more effective on a windsurf board or on the winging, right? So on the windsurf, you're going fast, you got more control, you can go in and out of the channel, you can stay, you know, you can launch from anywhere you want, you got a better wind range, you can go with lower wind, you can hold stronger wind, you got a lot of more control. The winging is new, it's cool, but it's not that that level of windsurfing. Like the level we got in windsurfing equipment right now is it's insane. Insane. It's insane. Insane. I mean, I don't. I got a wing. I go once in a while. I go to try something, whatever. But you know, if I turn around, shoot, go back and get my windsurfing for you. <laughs> Boom. That's, yeah. It's no comparison, really. So, it is fashionable right now. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I got that result with the kids. I'm like, you want to go wing? Okay, go and swim. Uh, not really. I go windsurf. So yeah. it's not going to be a threat for us. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Winging is not going to be a threat for the windsurfing community, especially after I see what we do for our kids. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like, it, I don't know, man, this is really inspiring. You know, it just, it just sounds like it takes, we should clone you and just put you in, you know, in 50 different places around the world and the sport would be fucking booming. <laughs> we'll be booming for sure. Remember, we're only going to live once. And uh, and we don't do what we dream of, nobody's going to do it for us. So this is our best chance to do whatever we want, right? And yeah. and, and the agree to make money is not really part of the equation. We are doing this because of passion. And now i got more passion. My daughter is so fired up about windsurfing. So now i got to keep going. And unless something really catastrophic happens, I think uh, we're moving forward, speed incredible, because there is no competition, really. Uh, truly, well, for what I'm doing right now in the U.S., there is no competition, because the biggest punch was to get into the Jack Club and actually show them that is right now, when surfing foil and between all the clubs that I'm doing, which are, just to give you an idea, out of uh, the Opti's, uh, circuit, uh, you know, the tour in the U.S., which is, I think it's probably about maybe 3,000 kids racing in Optis, on and off, right? Between the Green Flea and the Motor Vans, different category, whatever. Out of that, I got the best girl in the country and the best boy in the country. Imagine that. All from my club. They came from all the clubs because they want to join Windsor. Windsurfing right now, we are the highest with the foil, the highest fashion sailing craft for youth in the world. There is no comparison. Kite surfing, they have no chance because they got the problem with the hunger, with the lines, and they need a boat to go out with the same retarded stuff. Super fast, but infrastructure-wide, it's not work, it's not workable. You can't get out, you need a special launch, somebody to help. This is just and, and windsurf. I gave my kid nine years old. Here's foil board. They got to rig by themselves. They got to put the foil together. They carry the board, nine years old. They go out with a full foot or a five oak. No matter what the win is, sell for three hours, come back with a smile. That's it. Yeah. We, we yeah. win. That's it. The right now, we just got to replicate this, multiply more, maintain the infrastructure. And it's just, uh, truly, it's going to be huge. I, I, my opinion is going to be huge. I'm always a big dreamer everywhere anyway, but I don't, <coughs> I don't see 
the limitation. That's what I'm trying to say, because we, and on top of that, you know, like we're putting a lot of colors on ourselves right now, because if you look at the picture, I really wanted to recreate the, <clears throat> the image from the eighties, right? Where everything was, if we have a lot of sales, there are, you know, like Dacron sales, the school sales, we put so many colors. It looks like the 80, you get five cells on the water. It looks like it's 20 kids. Saying. If you get five cells with the same color, it looks like five cells, right? So more color, more stuff. The kids love it. Uh, it it's just bring a lot of flavor into, especially when you're on the water, like you, you, you're on the water with this, with, with our thing, windsurf thing with 20 kids. And then next door, we have another 40 kids product on Optis. We take over the energy in the water, like huge. Like the kids are sailing up this, look in the windsurfing guy and the girl. Ah, for sure, yeah. And that's it. And that's that's the that's how you win the game. It's so, so in, some ways, in some ways, in some ways, it's 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 pretty retarded that windsurfing is under sailing, but in other ways, it's a win, right? Because you're getting into yacht clubs already yeah, existing infrastructure. And this, is, and this is a fine line that we didn't really ever make because it was again. The only one to introduce windsurfing as an Olympic sport at the Jack Club level, right? Forever. Yeah. And yeah. <coughs> nobody did in a, in a full school with six years old starting level. I mean, by the time I finished with some of my kids, they're going to be windsurfing 11 years until they are 17. Think about that. They're going to be with us an infrastructure for 11 years. These, people, these kids are going to be monsters. Monster of windsurfers, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah, amazing yeah. level, and uh, and that's what it was missing because also it goes the money, the money part of the jack club, right? Like why the jack club want to invest on an entry level board, intermediate board, and the foil board? That's three boards, a lot of sales size. So I, you know, designing the board. What I did, I took everything and I make it two boards only, one board for entry level, intermediate, and advanced with a you know, hybrid, yeah. Have it, but good enough to, to get. And now I can put a foil on it, no problem. A little bit longer, but good. And then the convertible board, which is just full on foil or thing with a little bit more wind. But the kids are foiling on six knots of wind. So we sell, no matter what, we sell every day we foil, no matter what. Six knots, it's okay. And go. Yeah. Big front wind, Sick. small sales, go. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a winning situation. And this was the missing link because I try all this by organizing events. And, and you remember I've been organizing a lot of events in Miami. I brought Antoine to my event, Micah, Gonzalo, Sean O'Brien, Kudos, Kiani, you name it. Everybody came to my events. And I forever put money into as, as much as I could because I never asked the government for anything. So it was all my private you know, investment into the sport because the passion, truly you can't take anything away from that. There is no return on investment because everybody go home and 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 you don't get to build your local jungle community because yeah. you don't have the infrastructure of the yeah. backlog. But once you have the grassroots, actually the 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 top level, the cherry on top of the yeah. cake, a PWA event or an IQ foil yeah. event, whatever, you know, that then that actually makes sense, right? Yeah, now yeah. No, we'll, we'll continue doing, but but I change the energy, go yeah. back to the basic. Yeah. That's, that's basically, instead of continue pushing here to inspire the, the guys or our generation uh, who, 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 who got caught into many things in their life, I'm like, no, I'm going to inspire the next generation of kids and parents which is great because a lot of the parents now are buying equipment for themselves too. Now I got yeah. mom squad, right? I got a lot of moms that are coming and they buy equipment now in the family. So they got a family board. So it's, it's, we went back to, to the basic and, and doing a very strong basic. The rest will come by itself, right? The, yeah. the, the rest, it doesn't really matter. But, but the, the biggest thing was getting the Jack Club to understand the culture of Windsor and we need to integrate also to their cultural infrastructure after the school program hours. And one thing that they have to be abolished completely is uh, the weather forecast. You can't look at the forecast. We, we don't look at the forecast. I haven't looked at the forecast in whatever, forever, 
we try. We got a product on Tuesday to Friday and Sunday all day. I jump in my car, go to the club, no matter what. And now the parents understand they, there is no more question of, oh, there is windsurfing today. There is windsurfing every single day, no matter what. If it's raining, we rig and the rig sale. We talk about races. We talk about equipment. We, we do some of the clinic. The kids need to be there. So full on infrastructure. The parents love it. The kids love it. So the discipline is back into windsurf the way I want it. And then after that, you know, whatever, the kids will spin out. We go wave sailing, slalom, racing, Olympics. Um, but but it, this is a factory of windsurfers, pretty much. So it's, it's a full academy. And that's, I think it's going to pay off on the long, on the long run for us. And, and not, not too long from today, actually. I would say, yeah. you know, yeah. three or yeah. four years from now, we're going to see the U.S. coming back into the windsurfing thing at, at some point. We're, we're yeah. a stronger, younger team. Yeah, I hope um, I hope you know a lot of people with some connections and whatever listen to this podcast and just take that recipe and, and copy it. But one last one last subject because uh, we've been talking for ages, but we gotta talk about your brand, Tilo International. Um, it's been yeah, it's been a while already. Ah, huh? since I mean, obviously you you mentioned you were even making boards back in back in Cuba. You know, it, it you kind of always you, you always did stuff with gear right but now yeah. it's a proper brand you have a huge range of things um it's probably what the only north american brand i mean okay now we have north sales as well kind of relaunching relaunching and whatever but um yeah tell us tell us yeah, uh, well, advertise super- yourself uh, yeah, no, uh, I'm, I'm pretty low profile when it comes to my brand. Always, I'm more excited about what I talk about the kids because the brand will will is is you know it's a materialization of my ideas, right? I always wanted to 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 improve equipment. That's that's if you look at me, you can feel it's, for me it's all about infrastructure, right? So I, I want to fix stuff all the time and and make a product a little bit better. So I've been shaping forever, uh, but not super. But I started to start doing some serious stuff in 2010, where basically I'm like, you know what? I'm not buying any more board from any company uh, because there is always something and um, something is soft all the time. And I want them to change <laughs> and they don't change anything because who you are, right? I don't, they don't care. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make my own board. And then I started 2010 and then I started making board for, so more friends and I made formula boards basically and then slalom boards and, and on and on. And then that lead to a little bit copper of wave board, wave from Miami. Not that great, but whatever. <laughs> now, now we got the other. Can't have it all. Can't have it all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have to have bump and jump wave board no matter what, because, you know, we got a little bit of wing and bump. So the brand was, I work on my brand out of my garage for, for a long time. And then uh, the last, you know, five years, that's the only thing I was doing, just making board. I, you know, I didn't make many board, but I pull out like almost 25 boards a year by myself. And uh, and I'm lazy, right? Because I was doing some other stuff too. But uh, about two years ago, I got together with a friend of mine, with two friends, and, and they have a big uh, store in the U.S., uh, retail store. So they're moving a lot of, merchandise and we'll decide to go into production and then we find this super cool guy who uh was also john and uh he's he's starting his new manufacturer company uh through our good friend uh, scott bakechi and uh, and we we connect and uh they open the door for us to start making board and uh, the beautiful thing with then is that we can you know we don't have we, we have more flexibility on, on the shape, but we don't have to do a huge minimum quantity on each model. So we, we have an opportunity to, to explore more, to do, you know, some different shapes. And, and, uh, I've been working on, on, on everything for, you know, uh, boards that, that work for every segment on the market, right? Like, I don't want it, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for, for me. Because you know the minimum quantity is limited, so I can develop you name it. I mean, whatever the only can 
like we signed Diony this this year in January after we've been talking for a long time, and we kind of say Diony, look, we 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 super excited, but uh, I, I don't think we're ready for you, and <laughs> you know it, it's a big commitment, right? It's, it's, you got to pay this guy, it's a right, you got a family, it's not a kid, you know this. And I'm serious, guy. We are serious, you know. We say yes, it's yes, no matter what. And uh, so I don't say we're ready, but you know, it's like yeah, let's do it together. We'll, let's do it. You see, and I'm like okay. Uh, and then we signed Diony, which is probably the best thing we ever done so far, because uh, you know the best possible writer uh, that you can have for what we needed, uh, because we want a, a more open, broad lifestyle with equipment our focus is in north america and hopefully the the whole american continent right so we we wanted to have a guy here that that is part of the culture right johnny is an american guy who was grew up in venezuela in the middle so he he can do any market the spanish market the english market the european market so he can do pretty much everything so we're super happy to have him and then on top of that you give him Whatever you give him, hey, here is whatever, and he makes that stuff look good, right? Wait yeah. board, whatever, free foil board, racing, slalom, Delphi win. But I mean, like, we need to get him a board for the Delphi win. And it's like, oh, I need a slalom board. And I'm like, all right, let's go to work. And I make, <laughs> I make him two boards and no time. Uh, and we tested, the, we tested one day before the Miami. Before he went to a Delphi win, and you know he finished 19 on the 92 liter board, one day testing. So the board was, I mean, obviously I did a lot of slalom board before. He came with some ideas, and we put stuff together, and and we didn't make a mistake. We didn't make a, you know, he didn't win, but you were there. It's, it's tough. I think we all have tough to be thinking, yeah. rethinking the foil stuff. It's going to be the next year ticket, yes or yes. But 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 the board is. Gray board, finish 19 is, it show you everything, 36 knots, speed on that board, uh, with range and 92 liters. So, so that's the beauty of the international, right? Like if, if he can, you know, we'll, we find something on the market that is, that is open up, right? Like a little niche, like, like the free foil wave, uh, you know, board, for example, right? That's a board that, that I love it because it bring an opportunity to wave sailing on light wind condition, right? And 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 that's a board that I developed. And and the only took it to Los Roques and is just saw the video. It's just amazing. We now we're Closing, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, we're making a version two of that. We fix on stuff. And so everything that we do at the International, whatever I decide, want to be number one functional, right? Like the old F2 brand fun and function. I always love the F2 brand, but I want the board to be functional first. I, I hate to to sell anything to the customer that that three years from now is not going to be useful. I, I can't do that. So I needed to look a little bit ahead to see what stuff goes, but I needed to, you know, give a board to the customer that customer will will see the value on the investment, right? Yeah. Uh, and not changing a board every year. Uh, I can improve it, but the basics. So that's kind of what we do, and uh, to international, and, and we try to have a, you know, a board or equipment for each segment, you know, of of the market. Because as the windsurfing split up into one million scene, people have different personality. People love different things. So you need to have a wave board, yes or yes. You need to have a slalom board. You need to have a foil board. You need to have a speed foil board. You need to have a course racing for your board. You need to have a school board. You need to have a convertible board. The guy who's going to buy one board, they're going to put a foil or a thing, a slalom, you name it. So that's that's what we do. We we basically have everything. I'm yeah. always looking. What what is it that we're missing? You know what I mean? Hey, tell me one thing. How do you get that energy? I want that energy, man. <laughs> you bring me a sample song. I'm going to teach you the trick. And and this is true. I got a lot of energy. But when I don't have energy, I drink this. And these people actually sponsor me for a long time. We're proud of only, no money wise, but uh, this, this sense is good. They don't sponsor me anymore. I buy it. 
because this is the Amazon. Amazon energy. <laughs> Amazon. You get if they got in Maui. Uh, it's this amazing product. I mean, it's it's a chain that I promoted, but it's truly an amazing product. So you take one of these, and your day is very very good. Right on, man. This is. I mean, you got a lot of stuff going on, and it's it's so cool to hear. And you know, for <laughs> us, like I think, like if. I have this idea of, you know, the sports that that the that the US is a good way to to grow a sport, you know, it's such a big market and it's full of people with with passion and with, you know, with thinking big and everything's big yeah. and everything's sold well and whatever and this grassroots program you're doing plus your brand plus the plus the plus the stories of, you know, of escaping Cuba, I mean, what a podcast, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, a lot of it, and, and, and you know, keep doing the great job, and we'll definitely watching everything you guys doing, and really learning a lot from that. Uh, you know, it's different people with different perspective, and uh, and it's beautiful because it's, it's just up and up more. And I, you know, truly open a lot of the little detail that we do for 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 growing the sport, and I hope some other people in some other country can use that. Uh, this information is, is there to grow the sport. I think you were talking the other day <clears throat> that we all got to, and I think it's just or something, we all have to come together if we really want to bring the sport more forward. And and and, and that's really what I think we should do because we, we have to look at ourselves as a family because they, all the sport, they look at themselves as a family. So we needed to be more I know one day I talked to Josh Angulo and he's, he said something one time that he came to Miami, some of my event, and he said something so subtle that I stick in my mind. It's like, you know, windsurfing is a family business and it's true. So most of the windsurfing business from before, they were family business. And so we got to stick together as a family and, and collaborate with each other. A lot of stuff now happening now that I got the brand. A lot of companies are collaborating with us as a brand, sell manufacturers, a lot of more things are happening. And that give, it gave me a lot of more hope that we now in general, we open up more to, to, to grow the market instead of, of, you know, closing and just promoting our own product. Right. We just yeah, got to sell uh, totally. the idea because it's, look, it's 350 million people in the U S truly, I don't need any more than that. <laughs> that's a lot yeah. of people. Yeah. I don't need more than that. That's a lot of more, a lot of people, a lot of sale, a lot of foil. But we need to get that market and you know, school systems and clubs and all that definitely is 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 the way to go at the yeah. beginning and then the, the rest will come. Yeah. Oh. Windsurfers unite. Thank you, um, Alex. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm sorry, a long story, no, no, but so much. Very everything. good. Very good, man. We appreciate right, thank you. you. Thank you Keep so much. Keep in touch. Man. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> there we go. What did you think of that podcast? Let me know in the comments below what has been your favorite podcast so far. I'd be really interested to know your top three. Stick it in the comments. Give us a thumbs up, like, obviously subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any more of the podcast. They're coming every Wednesday. We're alternating between uh, live podcasts, which we're doing as well. Uh, and we're obviously doing the podcast that you've just heard. If you want to chip in some beer money, support the channel. It does cost money to do these sort of things. So if you do like it, windsurfing is a niche sport and we do need your support. Uh, and we're obviously giving away the giveaways and all that stuff to help give something back to you guys as well. Uh, so I hope you're liking it uh, and we'll see you for the next one.